We have former senior military intelligence officer Philip Ingram. Uh, I'm definitely not going to say that combination of two words. It don't just do it. it keeps boggling. Don't, 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 don't go there. Don't what go is there. What's going on? Um, but no, Philip, I want to start with you because I know this is a, a subject you're sort of pretty passionate about in terms of whether our armed forces need more money or whether they should just be spending it better. I, I think they need to do both. They need to learn how to spend it better, first of all, before you give them more money. You know, I liken it to um, the, the, the old uncle with a, a, a problem with his finances. You, the solution isn't give him more money. It's sort out the issues that he has with his finances and then give him more money if necessary to bail him out. Defence does not spend its money well. We've got a significantly larger budget than Poland and we've got... Uh, in, the, in the future, we're buying or we're upgrading um, probably about 10% of the number of tanks that Poland's got. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Philip, uh, you know, in the 1950s, in the slipstream of the Second World War, 7% uh, of our GDP went on defence. And that has been going steadily down ever since. It's a well-known syndrome. Uh, when countries are close to war, uh, just after a war, they spend a hell of a lot on defence. And the more they forget that war, the less they spend. And that is the situation we are in right now. And yet... We have, I would suggest, maybe a major war brewing. Uh, and mm. right now, uh, we spend 2% of our GDP on uh, defence. And people like James Heapy, uh, for military leaders, our armed forces chiefs are all saying this under the circumstances of what's going on in the world right now is not nearly enough. We need to prioritise uh, defence spending. Uh, that's taking on board your excellent point that we'll probably spend it unwisely. But you take, we do need to give defence more money. We, we, we do, because if um, the worst happens and you know, we've got a, a war in Europe, we've got a brewing war in the Middle East and we've got huge tensions in Southeast Asia, if the worst happens, then... Uh, you know, the, the amount of money that we're going to have to spend on defence is huge, but the lead time to get equipment in place is huge, and that's just going to lead to even more casualties. We currently... NATO requires us to spend 2% of our GDP. We're currently spending 2.2%. The government has said it's going to go to 25 when the economic conditions um, are there. But, I, but you know, I have to agree with some of the comments that came out in Parliament. It's when the threat conditions suggest you need to spend more is when you need to get in, re revamp the MOD to make sure it spends it wisely, give it the additional money and get it spending now because it's an insurance... Um, uh, it's, it's an insurance that we need in place and it takes time to get that ramped up. We, we can't just switch 2.5% on and then all of a sudden all of our military problems are, are sorted out instantly. How seriously should we <clears throat> be taking what Russia did to Grant Shapps' plane the other day, coming back, of course, from that big NATO exercise uh, near Sweden, um, the jamming, the signal jammer that they put out in the area where I think he lost GPS and, and radar was plane did for a good half an hour. I mean, how dangerous is this and what, what are the Russians up to? Well, what Russia's doing is extremely dangerous and they're, they're trying to disrupt in every way you know, any activities that are going on. What, what happened to Grand Shapps aircraft is not unusual. Um, that GPS jamming and, and other um, electronic interference has been coming out of Kaliningrad for months and months and months. Um, the, the, the pilots on board the aircraft will have reverted to you know, other means to navigate and, and there, there would have been no threat whatsoever. But it is in, um, impeding civilian aircraft flying in the area and everything else. So... They're, they're, they're just, they're being dangerous in what they're doing. And it reflects how Russia just doesn't care about um, the international rules-based society that um, you know, we're all supposed to be part of. Uh, we can't let Russia win in um, Ukraine because if we do, they will just come back and um, start to take over other countries around the world. And it will stimulate other nations that have got... Um, uh, uh, ideas on capturing territories uh, to go off and do it themselves. I'm going to speculate here, Philip, uh, but uh, I would suggest that Mr Heapy, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back for him was probably that budget last week uh, by Jeremy Hunt, in which, to uh, many people's amazement, there was no mention of defence spending at all uh, and certainly no mention of a rise in defence spending. Many people, particularly those involved in the military sector and, as I say, the Ministry of Defence, uh, feel that he should have prioritised this. Uh, they are sort of sticking their fingers in the air at their ears, 
and going, la, 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 no war, nothing to see here. Uh, they've got to start getting real, have they not? And I think Mr Heapy has decided enough is enough. I can't take any more of this. We may see more defections. Well, well, I hope that was his motivation. He didn't say that clearly no, and plainly no. in his resignation letter, which he should have done if he was showing that level of moral courage. Of course, we've got Grant Shapps turning around saying that there should be 3% of GDP uh, being, being spent on it. And we haven't got any of our senior generals, air marshals, um, or admirals resigning over a lack of funding going into their services, which would send an even stronger political statement. Um, it wouldn't affect their pensions in any way, shape or form because they've already qualified for them, but it would send a very, very strong political statement. The cynic in me says that government ministers have to spend, I think it's two years uh, before they can go back and start lobbying on different, uh, you know, back into the lobbying into the government or the department that they come from. Um, and you know, James Heapy will have looked at the, his chances in the election and gone, well, you know, I'll start the two years count now for me to get into a decent job uh, when I get out working into one of the defence primes. But that's me just being cynical. When we look at the state of our armed forces and find them wanting, we are, of course, part of NATO, uh, which is <clears throat> important, brings together lots of countries, uh, each, I, I would imagine, with their own capabilities. As a collective, are we big enough and strong enough to face down whoever might, uh, you know, challenge us? From a collective perspective, yes, 100%. And that's why Putin will... Poke NATO where he can. You know the G the GPS spoofing and and the the jamming that's that's going on in Europe. Uh, but he does not want a conflict with NATO. He knows that he will lose. You know, NATO collectively, um, you know, whilst the UK armed forces um, are not as strong as they they should be, you put them into and plug them into the the NATO socket and bring all of the other capabilities from around NATO together. Uh, and it is a very very formidable force. You know, it, it, in GDP terms, it outspends the Rus the Russians by factors of um, uh, up up to 100, I would I would expect, and uh, similar similar with the Chinese. The Americans being the biggest partner that's in there bring so many different capabilities that you know, NATO um, without the US would have real difficulty operating. Uh, and uh, I assume that's what this uh, recent NATO exercise was all about in the northern seas. Uh, really good to see that the British uh, aircraft carrier Prince of Wales finally got out of dock uh, and looks rather magnificent at the head of a very impressive fleet. So I, I take that as a kind of encouragement that the NATO nations are in those exercises with those really impressive pictures are sending Mr Putin a firm message, aren't they? Yes, you, we've got 32 countries in NATO now. Um, the two newest members are participating in the exercise. It's all about being able to work out how you can um, work together, um, whether that be working together technically, whether it be um, using the same terminology, it's the same understanding as the different activities. You know, the, 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 and a good example of the sort of complexities that they work out in this are, um, you know, we go over to the continent with a three pin plug, you need an adapter to get it into um, a, a continental socket. These exercises are making sure that everyone's got the right adapters for understanding who's <coughs> going to do what so we can work together um, instantaneously as needed to, um, to, to face up any threat. You can always get those uh, converter plugs at every airport, <laughs> so that shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> Philip, exactly, you. but um, the, you, the converter plugs for different weapon systems, um, I haven't seen many of those at the airport. <laughs> on on sale at WH Smith's, so you might be right uh, there. I'm, I'm looking at the wrong stand there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Philip. Thanks, Pleasure Philip. to talk to you as always.